Seismic wings! Paul felt awash with relief as soon as he heard the voice. Even amongst his peers within the Doom faction, a great majority of the disciples grew stiff at her voice, paralyzed by fear, regardless of whether it was a joyous, joking shout. Just the thought that the spiritual warrior from Godric's land would want to spar with them sent chills down their spine. Her sparring and training went on for hours. It never let up. Even four hours in, if you thought you saw an opening, it wasn't one. It was just that she had become so good at reading your movements that she could feign openings and weaknesses. That was the kind of Doom Faction disciple Saben Treslin was. Where others eked out whimpers at the sound of her voice, Paul grinned. A gust of wind burst out. It sent even the most giant of Harold's landers flying into the air, off the precipice, like rag dolls abandoned by spoiled daughters. Paul could just make out the dual blades of Saben's fearsome battle axe as it was lifted up, only to be slammed down onto the ground. The mountain shook. Paul wanted to shout to Saben, but another voice stole his words. Be careful! Then he saw him. Bertie Pond's blade was made of a hazy tendril of smoke. Where a blade typically was, only the shadow of one remained. He swung his sword. The tendril followed like a swinging vine of darkness, lashing at a herald's lander. At the mere touch, the herald's lander shrieked out in agony and vanished into thin air. Seismic winds! A burst of wind knocked a herd of herald's landers in the other direction, hurtling down the peak to their certain elimination. Paul saw a herald's lander trying to flank Bertio. He raised his bow, pulled the string taut, and fired a spirit-seeking arrow that hit the enemy squarely in the chest. The herald's lander staggered back. A second later, he vanished into thin air. Withyard charged into the last of the belligerent disciples. He extended his jaw wide and spewed a burst of fiery primordial energy straight onto their faces. They cried out. Raging with adrenaline, Withyard faced Bertio and Saben, ready to attack when they scrunched their noses. Who's this awfully odorous presence? Bertio hid his disgust a little better. I don't think I've ever seen you around before, but Castle Doom's a big place, I suppose. Saben, face contorted in perpetual repulsion, covered her nose with a hand. I think I would have caught at least a whiff. What is it? Burnt flesh? Withyard felt a hand on his back. It was Paul. They're okay. We're all friends. Suddenly bereft of enemies to fight on the sacred mountain peak, Withyard's frenzied rage dissipated. The air around him cooled. He hobbled towards the stone monument and leaned against it as he sat. In fending off the Herald's Land disciples, he'd sustained the most wounds. Numerous deep cuts riddled his arms and chest. His breaths came out ragged, like wind blowing through a craggy tunnel. <laughs> Withyard closed his eyes. Adrenaline fading, there was nothing left for the lanky disciple to run on. He forced his eyes back open, but his eyelids were heavy. Paul and Frederick went to his side. Withyard? Frederick brought out his flask of water. Uh, drink it. I, I can do something, I, I think. Frederick held the flask to Withyard's mouth, where Paul and Frederick noticed cracks spreading from the tall disciple's lips, like an infection marked by thin red tendrils spreading out over the face. Withyard shut his eyes. Frederick tried to feed Withyard water, but the tip of the flask steamed. Smoke whisked out from Withyard's mouth. He remained as motionless as a corpse as Bertio and Saben approached with trepidation. Is he? Paul shook his head. Withyard hadn't vanished into the thin air. The spiritual marker the elders placed in all of the disciples had not yet deemed Withyard dead. He hung by a thread, but Paul had already seen his incredible restorative abilities before. 
there was something undeniably otherworldly about Withier's spiritual technique. Even now, he could sense the spiritual aura within Withier lapping against the wounds like gentle waves, dragging away the pain with each little tide. Paul rose and faced his friends. He'll live. He, Berdio, and Saben regarded each other silently before all three of them broke out into grins. It looked like you were in quite the pinch, Paul. Nothing I wouldn't have been able to handle. Saben raised an eyebrow. Really? Because I'm quite certain you would be falling a thousand feet back down to Earth right about now if it weren't for us, you know, stepping in and saving the day. Paul slung his bow over his shoulder. It's been done before, surviving a thousand foot fall. Bertio scoffed. Right, and you are Baylor Graham, vanquisher of the Vaslan Terror. Paul shrugged. Huh, I was there. He thought about Baylor, a living legend among Calandrians. His recent appearance had given the whole tournament a more dour note, and with Withier to sleep, Paul figured it was the best time to fill everyone else in on the situation. He glanced over to Frederick. Come, I have something to tell you. Saben arched an eyebrow and gazed at the young disciple as a god would a mere mortal. He? You've allied with Frederick Stone? Paul patted Frederick's back. Did you not see him earlier? He fended off the Herald's Land brutes alongside Withyard. There's more than meets the eye with him. Frederick seemed completely petrified by Saben's gaze. She was, of course, a living legend in her own right amongst the Doom Faction disciples. Before they left Castle Doom for the Sacred Mountain, there had been a running betting pool on who would win. Saben had been widely regarded as having the best odds. Saben, Treslin. She snorted. He who ran away the first time we were supposed to spar. Bertio's eyes curved into crescent scythes. I think that's less a slight on Frederick Stone's fortitude, and more a testament to how most people can't bear to be with you. Saben pushed Bertio, who staggered a few steps close to the edge of the cliff. Paul clapped his hands, bringing all attention towards him. Listen, I have something to tell all of you about the tournament. He started by recapping everything he knew about Withyard about the two-year-long assignment Elder Dre had supposedly sent him on, about the peculiar nature of his spiritual technique, and about the masked figure that had ambushed them the previous night, seeking to take Withyard and hindered only by Baylor. Paul noticed Bertio's lips purse into a frown, a rare sight for someone usually so casually jubilant. Baylor showed up? He's entrusted me to look after Withyard. There's an outside danger that's managed to infiltrate into the tournament. And we don't know why they want Withyard? Paul looked over to Withyard. Already, the wounds across the forearm had healed a considerable amount. It could be for a number of reasons. Perhaps he's made enemies in the assignment we know nothing about. Perhaps there are others interested in exploiting his unique techniques. It doesn't matter. If Baylor has asked me to protect him, that's all I need to do. Paul took a deep breath. <sighs> but I need all the help I can get. The entity that showed up last night, they were terrifyingly strong. They were on another level entirely. All while Paul spoke, Saben remained ghostly pale. Finding a lull in the conversation, she cleared her throat to interject. <clears> throat> There's something more. Bertio nodded. Saben saw something last night, too. Her throat felt dry as she said the dreaded words aloud. A dead disciple? I think it was Nelson. Paul frowned. Dead as in? Saben's silence confirmed what Paul was thinking. Despite the absence of strong wind, he shuddered. That... that makes no sense. 
the elders, they... Paul trailed off, suddenly finding his throat dry as well. Bertio said he sensed something off about the tournament from the very beginning. The handsome Godrickslander nodded. Everything we've been doing, the reason why we're here. Doesn't it feel like we were deliberately sent here without any direction? As if we walked into a trap. Paul and Frederick shared a look. We figured that that was the point of the tournament. Berdio looked up at the clouded sky. Maybe, but still, there are too many peculiarities outside the hidden rules we've all discovered. It feels off. All of it. A strange shimmer radiated past them. It stirred Withier to wake too. As he shifted up groggily, Saben looked up at the top of the stone monument and froze. As the sun peeked through the clouds above, a large shadow cast over all of them. Friends! The rest of them turned. Perched atop the stone monument was the same beautiful woman Saben had seen killing a disciple. Maiden Maud. <laughs> How fun! Look who we have here. A chilling pair of ice-blue eyes landed on Saben and her mighty battle-axe. Godric's land. Saben of the Treslin family. Fears she will never be more than her weapon, in the same way she fears never being more than her family name. Saben flinched a little. The icy blue eyes moved casually over to Bertio. Ah, Bertio, of the Pond family. Once a lineage of dukes and duchesses, but now, like the martial technique passed down, nothing but smoke. Bertio's hand hovered over his scabbard, ready to unsheathe. Saben's eyes drifted over to Frederick, as if they were having a casual stroll along idyllic plains. Frederick Stone, youngest of eight children, and the only one who remains alive since tragic events over the last decade. Heavy is the burden of being an only child, is it not? Especially when you must be the one to keep the family's elemental sword style alive. Rather than whimper or cower, Frederick let his head sink. Maiden Maud's red lips pursed into a smile as her eyes found Paul next. Paul, of a disgraced family. The archer who lives in the shadow of a warrior living in the shadow of a hero. How dreadful! How far must you look until you find a place where you truly belong? Though no one but Maiden Maud noticed, Paul had already drawn his bow, a spirit-seeking arrow aimed directly at the spot between the intruder's eyes. But the troop master of the wandering troop did not flinch. She tilted her head down, extending the nape of her neck. Her eyes flit over to the figure at her feet. Alas, withered gray, a mere egg with a name. Should you seek the truth about who you really are, I suggest you forego playtime here and come with me. Withered glanced up, bleary-eyed. He crawled away from the stone monument, closer to Paul, Frederick, Berdio, and Saben, for a better look at the person who sat atop the stone, silhouetted by the sun's gleam. But before he could crawl too far... A statue of a mighty warrior clad in rose-gold armor thundered down from the sky. It crashed down onto the precipice, shaking the earth as it landed beside Withyard. The mere impact sent Withyard flying, but then the statue moved on its own. Its arm extended out to grab Withyard by the throat before he could fall. The rose-gold hue of the statue shimmered under the sun, looking like copper from some angles, and like Eldridge's gold in others. 
Paul loosened his arrow straight towards Maiden Maud, but she merely smiled. The rose gold statue raised its other arm and caught Paul's spirit seeking arrow in his hand. The glowing aura vanished like mist in the tight clench. Maiden Maud maintained a perfectly serene smile as if she were posing for an oil portrait. She sat on the stone monument as if it were her throne. She fixed a calm gaze onto Paul. You don't want to fight back. It'll only lead to a more gruesome death. She shifted her focus to address all of them. Unfortunately, this is not a tournament where a disciple emerges victorious with a sacred sword. There is no sacred sword. There is no tournament. Her lips curved a little higher, as if unable to resist a far more laughable delight. Your great elders are in their big old tent right now, staring at an enchanted glass orb, thinking they are witnessing everything they should be. However powerful their spiritual sight is, it has been far too easy to slip from their detection. Your faction is a joke, and by dusk, the elders and the disciples will all be no more. I'm sorry all of you have been implicated in this, but you're mere children. You don't understand what the real world is like yet, outside the comforts of Castle Doom. Her smile folded back into its usual calm state. I promise to shield you all from the pains of reality. It'll be quick and relatively painless. Maiden Maud leaned backwards. Then she kept leaning back. She rolled down the stone monument and plunged down the precipice. The rose gold statue turned stiff, and with its grip hardening around Withyard's throat, it toppled down with Maiden Maud following after. Paul's eyes widened. He and the others raced over the edge, only to find that Maiden Maud had completely vanished. The rose gold statue plummeted into the forest canopy below, with Withyard flailing, still unable to pry himself free. Saben remained as pale as a clean tunic. That's... that was her... Paul's head spun. That's Maiden Maud of the Wandering Troop. Why would she be here? What is she doing here? Bertio kept the most composed of the four. We need a way down. Frederick blanched. Uh, what? Everything Paul mentioned about Wizard, Baylor, and outside forces, it's all happening now. We can't let Wizard be taken away. Paul calmed his nerves. Everything Bertio said was true. There was no time to ask questions. It was time to act. How do we get down? We can't fall behind. Paul looked to Saben, who, though built as sturdy as a mountain, shook like a leaf. Saben? Saben startled back at the sound of her name. Uh huh? We need you for this part. Saben stammered. Frederick saw her first trembling as hard as his own. He found it difficult to fathom how someone as self-assured, as mighty as Saben Treslin, could be as scared as he was. Paul placed a hand on her shoulder. She reeled back. Beads of perspiration dotted her forehead. Saben? Look at me. Her eyes found Paul's eyes. Look at us. Take a deep breath. We need the gust. Her voice continued to shake. The, the, the gust? I haven't been able to muster it readily when we spar. Paul pointed down at the forest hundreds of feet below. Because you never needed it. We need it now, Saben. Paul softened. I know what you saw must have been terrifying. I have about 600 questions myself, but right now... All we should do is do what we do best. Bertio nodded and joined in. We have to fight. 
Saben's eyes flashed with conviction. Her muscles tensed. She lifted herself up and held her battle axe so tight her fists no longer trembled. Let's jump! Frederick's jaw dropped. What? Paul turned to the youngest Doom Faction disciple. We have to jump. I, I, I thought the whole point of staying up here is so that we don't, you know, uh, fall to our deaths. Paul closed his eyes briefly and stared down at the plumage of green leaves that covered the forest. He noticed rustling. Withyard's there. We have to go after him. Uh, but, but what about what Troopmaster Maud said about us? Uh, about us dying? Uh, about the Doom Faction being no more? Paul picked up Frederick's daggers and placed them in the boy's hands. You're alive right now, are you not? Uh, I am. Then stay alive. Right now, we need to do whatever it takes to get Withyard back, and that means falling from the peak of this mountain to catch up. One thing at a time, Frederick. Frederick caught Saben standing at the edge of the cliff, holding her battle axe and whispering to it. As much as it had bewildered him to see Saben so frightened moments ago, it bewildered him more so to see her transform into a complete calm. He stammered some more. Uh, I, I think falling from here is a bit counterintuitive to staying alive, I, is it not? Bertio looked over with a calm smile. It was the same smile Bertio always wore, the kind that curved his eyes into small sickles. Do you trust us, Frederick? I don't really know you two. Nonetheless, we're your only option right now. Would you rather come with us or stay here? Maybe you can figure out what the stone monument means and how to find the holy waters, because the tournament is still so important. Frederick sighed. <sighs> Stop it. Uh, I get it. His eyes soaked in Berdio and Saben, both of them keeping a careful eye down at the forest canopy. He settled onto Paul, who used the holes of the stone monument to climb up for a better vantage point. Uh, I trust you guys. Saben cracked a grin. Good, because I don't really trust myself. Frederick paled. <laughs> What? Paul interjected before Frederick could say any more. When we jump, you jump. Paul loaded a spirit-seeking arrow, aiming it at the rustling patch of the forest below. Saben, follow the arrow, okay? Okay. Let's go. Paul let the arrow fly. There was a horrible moment of silence, and then a gust of wind. Nathan swore to himself as he hovered in the air, just high enough to where the rainstorm obscured him from the views of those passing by. Sixty or so feet directly below him lay the broken, mangled heap that was once Bertha the Bloody. Nathan wanted to dive down and pick through her belongings, see if she had something to hide, but that opportunity was long past. The second Bertha's body had broken upon the cobblestone path leading to Everhallow, it attracted quite a bit of attention. Armored guards formed a circle around the corpse, protecting it from wandering do-gooders, or more likely, keeping it safe from looters, until the city officials could have their turn picking the lifeless husk clean for valuables. Instead, Nathan turned his body and flew away from Everhallow back towards the dark landscape of Howell's Land. Since Nathan learned to fly, he had never flown in such difficult conditions as the current Howell's Land environment. The wind blasted him in every direction, and the rain buffeted him relentlessly. The cold droplets on the ground felt akin to knives, but up in the sky, they felt like shards of glass, hacking and slicing relentlessly. Nathan had worked on creating spiritual barriers between him and the unrelenting rain, but honing his power to a point where he could both focus on flying and deflecting the tiny wet missiles 
was a daunting and draining task, even for a powerful spiritual warrior. Nathan flew for about a quarter hour. Though the landscape below stretched out in an incomprehensible mass, he knew which way he was headed. He avoided Willow's fall entirely and soon alighted in a forest. Nathan's feet touched the ground and rested on top. He grinned, pleased he had been able to master his body's elements so well. Now he could strut across the surface of muddy ground as easily as a horse gallops across a field. A neigh captured Nathan's attention. He called out, One moment, my friend. I will be there soon. And he walked in that direction. It wasn't long before he saw his campsite. His faithful steed, Ghost Walker, stood underneath a tree, blessedly shielded from the rain, and a blue spiritual fire crackled by his feet. The Doom Faction's Grand Alchemy competition had taught Nathan a thing or two. He now made frequent use of his spiritual fire, especially in Howell's Land, where the coastline and the dry land were becoming more indistinguishable by the day. Nathan walked up to Ghost Walker and patted the horse on his flank. Well, old friend, I think we might be done avoiding civilization for now. Ghost Walker whinnied as if to say, It's about time. Nathan laughed and waggled his finger at his long-time traveling companion. I will take no such sass from you, thank you very much. Nathan walked over to a small pile of his belongings, and from it pulled up Ghost Walker's saddle. Ghost Walker reared up on his hind legs and shook his mane with joy. Nathan couldn't help but laugh at how excited his stallion was to rejoin the world. He wished he could share the same enthusiasm. Ghost Walker waited patiently as Nathan saddled him, strapped the travel packs onto his back, and then mounted up. Within minutes, the horse and rider were on the move again. Nathan steered Ghost Walker in the direction from whence he came, back to Everhallow. He felt a strange sense of foreboding approaching Howell's Land's capital. He had never interacted with Duke Victor Fang before, but had seen him in passing, back at the Calandrian Ducal Conclave, before the war. All he knew was that Duke Victor was notoriously reclusive, and preferred to keep the affairs of Howell's land to himself. As if he could read Nathan's thoughts, Ghost Walker snorted. Nathan rolled his eyes. His horse seemed to say, A reclusive duke, kind of like you these last few years. The stallion's imagined reply struck Nathan deeply. Perhaps there had been a note of self-reflection in his daydreaming. After the war, Nathan rode off. He had not seen Baylor, Sir Ian, his father, or almost anyone of his family or friends for two years. The only time he came to visit was when Amelia gave birth to her son, and even as the boy's uncle, Nathan had yet to spend any regular amount of time with the boy. After all, he had set off from Hayland with one mission, uncover the mystery behind his mother's murder. This guiding purpose had been obscured when the entire kingdom fell to war. But now, even though peace was tenuous, Nathan felt he needed to make real headway in his investigation. The closest he had yet come to finding any concrete evidence was when Castle Doom was infiltrated by the faithful, servants of those alien devils, the Netherborn. But even though they had shown their face that one time, this cult was still incredibly difficult to track down. Nathan traveled far and wide, searching out arcane secrets, tomes of knowledge from days of yore. He communed with spirits in haunted forests, listened to the whispers in a magical cave, and even dove through the grand library of Vassinor, in disguise, of course. Oddly enough, his travels had led him back to Castle Doom, still in disguise, of course, after the elders refused to take a stand in the war, Nathan had little desire to return to completing tasks for them, and yet he found that they still had pressing concerns with dark events going on in Howell's Land. 
Nathan finally made it to the main road. A weathered signpost pointed ominously onward with Everhallow scratched into the wood in jagged letters. He guided Ghostwalker down the road. It was a longer process than flying, but eventually they glimpsed the twisted spires of Everhallow in the distance. As Nathan and Ghostwalker galloped up toward the gate, Nathan observed that Bertha's body was nowhere to be seen. He couldn't help but be impressed by the efficiency of Everhallow's guards. They are champions at cleaning up when a body bloodies their streets. Nathan guided Ghostwalker through the gates and entered the Howell's Land capital for the first time. He was immediately struck by how different it was from the other cities he had visited. Calandriana had an asture grandeur to it, with wide streets and tall towers melded into the mountains. Filgebjorn was a friendly, warm place in spite of its harsh, cold climate. Skyhall City was lofty and expansive, nestled comfortably amidst trees. Godrickshall felt like a small town which had gradually grown into a capital. Compared with all these, Everhallow was distinctly inhospitable. The stone paths stuck out at odd angles, seemingly designed to trip up outsiders. The streets were all punishingly narrow. Houses were jumbled together, as if they had all crowded inside the walls before anyone could top them. Almost nothing was constructed with a straight line, except the twisted spires which loomed overhead, each adorned by a series of hideous stone gargoyles. Nathan took note of these features and followed the signs. Surely even a town as harsh as this would have a reasonably priced inn. An hour later, Nathan opened a door into his newly rented room. It was a simple arrangement, a bed, a desk, and a small but pleasant fire. Rain buffeted the window, so even if it had been daylight, Nathan doubted he would have been able to see anything much outside. Worn out by the day, Nathan lay back on the bed. He clicked his fingers. Immediately, the blazing yellow turned itself into a quiet blue flame. With his spiritual warmth surrounding him, Nathan let his eyes drift shut. These days, his dreams were filled with chaos. Bloody battles, tormented faces, all manner of suffering now graced Nathan's slumbering mind nightly. He saw his friends on both sides of the war. He saw his family. He saw them dying. Again and again and again and again and again. And throughout, he heard the returning warning echoing with his mother's voice. Beware the widow raven. It still made him shudder, even whilst he continued to not quite know its meaning. Something's not right. Nathan's eyes flew open. He moved to get out of bed, but all of a sudden, thick arms, strong as iron, grabbed all of Nathan's limbs and held him fast. Nathan pushed against them, then froze. Standing at the foot of his bed, a malicious grin carving her face, was Bertha the Bloody. Bertha's yellow teeth gleamed in the blue light cast by Nathan's spiritual flame. Restrained by minions, Nathan stared at his captor, confused. He had seen her body crumple, clearly dead, and yet here she stood looming over his prone body. Her face was covered in small scars and welts, and the stooped woman would occasionally grimace, clearly feeling some sort of intense pain. Whoever her employer is, they must have some powerful healing potions. But in spite of all the shock flying through his mind, Nathan refused to let a single iota of surprise show upon his face. Instead, he returned her smile, though his wasn't nearly as cruel as hers. Why, I must thank thee for returning. I was under the impression thou wert... indisposed? Bertha's smile twisted into a sneer. Oh, so now I know what can make the killing god into a polite little field mouse. Simply trap him, and he becomes as weak as a lamb. 
Nathan shrugged from his prone position. Uh, alas, I must confess, you have me. Your thugs here are too strong. He cast a glance at the ones holding his limbs. There were six of them altogether, all brawny men standing upwards of two meters tall. Two of them held his legs, while four pinned his arms. The corner of Nathan's mouth curled upward. They have no idea who they are facing. Bertha paced back and forth by Nathan's feet, stroking her chin. It didn't take keen observation for Nathan to tell that she was playing up her thoughts, rather than actually considering anything. Now, let me see, Nathan. Or Nate. May I call you Nate? I will, Nate. You held me prisoner and cut off my hand. She held up her right arm and examined her bandaged stump. How can I repay your kindness? I know. A hand for a hand sounds like a fair exchange. Bertha took one of Nathan's wrists as the thug who'd been holding it straightened and drew a cartoonishly large meat cleaver. He then produced a long, rounded steel blade and began to scrape the cleaver against it, honing the steel to a fine edge. Nathan kept his eyes fixated on the knife. Do you expect me to reveal something to you? Bertha laughed. Her belly chuckle reverberated in the small rented room. <laughs> Frankly, Master Hayfield, I want nothing from you. I was pleasantly untroubled by your existence until you had to mess with my work. And now you need the blade for it. She nodded toward her henchman with the blade. Nathan tensed. I could scream and bring the city watch down upon your head. Bertha laughed even louder than before. <laughs> oh, you are new to Everhallow. You could shriek until your lungs burst and Duke Victor's highly trained rubes but do nothing more than count the coins with which I line their pockets. Go. Cut him. Her henchman lifted his knife up in the air. Nathan clicked his fingers. The blue spiritual fire vanished. All of a sudden, the room was engulfed in blackness. Bertha's henchman shouted out in confusion. Where is he? Oh... After a moment of chaos, all sounds stopped. Bertha breathed heavily, not daring to make a sound. After an impossibly long silence, she heard fingers click. Blue light flooded the room again, revealing a bloody scene. Nathan stood to his full height, blood staining the front of his shirt. The knife-wielding henchman lay against the wall, his head split open by his own cleaver. The one who held Nathan's right arm lay face down, the point of the knife sharpener sticking out from the other side of his head. Three more of her henchmen were sprawled across the floor, their necks twisted. The final one writhed on the ground, clutching his still bleeding neck. After a moment, the final henchman stopped writhing. Bertha gulped. She stepped back toward the door, as slowly as she could, making sure that she didn't make any sudden moves. Please, Nathan, you were so reasonable. With her one remaining hand, Bertha the Bloody fumbled at her belt. Nathan turned, walked to the desk, and picked up his ancestral broadsword. He slowly drew it from its sheath. Now, Bertha, you know what I'm going to ask you, and this time, I want an answer. You cannot fall 60 feet to save yourself this time. Bertha looked toward the window. For a moment, Nathan was convinced that she would make a break for it and attempt to fling herself to the ground two stories below. But instead, she pulled something from her belt and brought it to her lips. A whistle. From off in the distance, Nathan heard a telltale click. Behind him, the window shattered. He whirled around and grabbed wildly, only barely managing to catch an arrow. The projectile's momentum forced him to fall backward onto the bed. His hand shook 
as he held the razor-sharp quarrel in his hand. While Nathan was distracted, Bertha seized the moment and grabbed the door handle. She flung it open and hurled herself down the hall. Nathan leapt to his feet, tossing the arrow away. He then leaped to the side, dodging two more arrows, which flew through the same window. Before the unseen archer or archers could fire more, Nathan rushed out of his room in pursuit of Bertha. The hallway of the inn's third floor was illuminated by dim candles. Through the yellow gloom, Nathan saw Bertha hastily turn a corner, pelting down the stairs. Curious faces peeked out of their various bedrooms, wearing faces from confusion to frustration. Nathan shouted at them as he rushed past. Stay in your rooms! He didn't turn to see if any obliged. Instead, he turned onto the stairs. Two thugs stood before him, thick, broad men, clearly cut from the same cloth as the ones he dispatched back in his rented bedroom. This time, they had swords and rushed upon him with murder in their eyes. Nathan sighed. He had no time for minions. He leapt, clearing three stairs at once. He landed between the two henchmen. They swung their blades at him in unison. Undaunted, Nathan spun his blade quickly, deflecting both attacks. Then he spun in a circle and sliced through both of their necks in a single swing. Nathan rushed forward. He didn't look behind him, as both henchmen stood there dumbly for one moment before their heads toppled off their shoulders, one and then the other. Another henchman with an axe was waiting for Nathan as he pelted down the hallway. Nathan roared in frustration. Bertha was now out of his sight, no doubt in the lobby already. The axeman swung down at Nathan. Nathan turned on his heel, spinning in a graceful and deadly pirouette. The axe-wielding man's blood splattered the second story's walls. Nathan bounded down into the lobby. The innkeeper, a plump woman with rosy cheeks, shrieked in fear at seeing the bloody man flying down her stairs. Nathan flipped a gold coin in her direction. She caught it, befuddled. Apologies for room 12, madam. And he rushed out into the night. Nathan rushed out into the darkness. He kept his Asura seeing eye open, scanning the sheets of rain for any hint of his fleeing foe. Nothing. Even the archers who fired at him must have left. He grunted in frustration. Just then, a voice shouted from the darkness. Nathan Hayfield? Nathan held his sword before him. Who goes there? Seven heavily armored people walked forward. They wore tabards, which bore the crest of House Fang. A clawed green hand with bloody nails, reaching up on a deep purple backdrop. Nathan rolled his eyes. Ah, great. Guards. One of the soldiers strode up to him. She had no weapon drawn, but approached him cautiously. I apologize, my lord, but we must detain you. Duke Fang's orders... Nathan sheathed his sword. He raised his hands, supplicatingly. Doth the duke know I'm here? The watch captain shook her head. N nay, but the watch is on high alert. Strange happenings across the land. One cannot be too careful. Nathan nodded. I understand. Take me to the duke then. Just as Nathan took a step forward, a haunting wail pierced the night. The guards looked around, frantically, confused. They put their hands on their swords. Nathan started laughing. The watch captain raised her eyebrows at him. Nathan shook his head and gritted his teeth apologetically. I think the innkeeper just had a look at room 12. Nathan walked alongside the seven guards through the twisting streets of Howell's Land. He found himself impressed that the squadron could easily keep in formation, in spite of the unpredictably narrow passageways that made up Everhallow. But that wasn't the principal thing that Nathan found curious about the city. As the group of them made their way toward the central spires, not a single person was walking the streets. 
Nathan remembered in his youth at the Academy of the Mystic Blades in Godrickshall, students were constantly getting into trouble in the after hours. But the only souls Nathan glimpsed were slinking through the shadows. He turned to the captain. Captain? Captain Ranyalt, sir. Nathan nodded. Captain Ranyalt, is there a curfew in place? Some of the guards snickered. The captain shot them a look. I, my lord. Ever since the first killings, no one is permitted to wander the streets after dusk. Nathan furrowed his brow. Did you catch the woman who ran out of the inn afore I did? Captain Ranyalt shook her head. Nay, we saw you first. Who were you after? Bertha the Bloody. I reckon you've heard of her? The captain blinked, astonished. Are you sure? My men scraped her body off the cobblestones this afternoon. It seems uh, she's hard to kill. The patrol turned a corner, and Nathan beheld Duke Fang's keep for the first time. Looming over the patrol was a building of polished white bricks that sloped upwards into itself. On the very edge and corner, there was some sort of ornamentation. Whoever built it must have cared deeply about the artistic side of construction. The farther up it went, the thinner it became, until the building split into three distinct spires, which loomed over other similar peaks on the buildings below. But unlike the Owl's Eye in Godrickshall, or the main keep of Calandriana, the door of Everhallow's central building was surprisingly modest. It was an iron door, only about ten feet high. Molded into the metal were scenes of historical or mythological import. Nathan didn't recognize them, so he assumed that they were locally based stories that he hadn't been around long enough to learn. Six of the guards lined either side of the door. Nathan and Captain Ronyalt walked between them, passing into the building. Soon, the two of them were alone, and they faced a massive spiral staircase, which twisted up into the rafters of the building before vanishing. Captain Ronyalt held out her arm. After you, my lord. Nathan nodded and started to climb the stairway. He could have flown, but he often found it inconvenient to fly indoors. So up the stairs, he and the captain went. The silence was oppressive. Nathan was keenly aware of how much time he was wasting, so he decided to risk asking a query. Uh, captain Ranyalt, did you know any of the murder victims? The captain kept her eyes gazing forward as they continued their ascension. I... I found one of the bodies. Twas a dear friend. Nathan winced. Oh, I'm sorry. Ranyalt shook her head. Be not sorry. It was two years ago. Time moves on. Nathan furrowed his brow. And in two years, no one has learned anything about the killings? The captain shook her head again. By this point, they reached a fork in the stairway. One branch led to the left and the other to the right. Both continued upwards. In the midst of the fork stood a guard. Captain Ronyard, sir. Make thyself at ease. The guard relaxed. Soldier, where is the duke? The guard gestured to the left staircase. North Tower, ma'am. I thank thee. The captain and Nathan took the stairs on the left. Nathan felt the guard's eyes follow him as they vanished up the winding and ever-narrowing stairs. Eventually, they reached a simple wooden door. Nathan turned to the captain. Thank you, Captain, but I think I must do this part alone. He grabbed the latch. Captain Ronyalt placed her hand over his, gently stopping him. Nathan looked up at his companion. She removed her helmet, revealing thin features and a black bun of hair tied up to better fit a helmet. He started. Without her helmet, 
she looked barely older than he was, if not the same age. Ranyalt looked in both directions, then hissed at him. Be careful what you reveal to Duke Victor. He might not be as eager to stop the killings as the rest of us. Nathan opened his mouth to speak, but the captain put her helmet back on and vanished down the staircase. He furrowed his brow. <sighs> More uncertainty. That's just what I needed. He opened the door and walked in. The room at the top of the spire was only a few feet across, with an open balcony facing outward. Duke Victor Fang stood, staring out over his fiefdom. Nathan cleared his throat. The Duke glanced over his shoulder. The torches on the wall cast a faint glow across his chest-length gray beard. He raised an eyebrow. Ah, Nathan Hayfield. I thought you were dead. Nathan laughed at the unintentional irony laced in this statement. <laughs> Death hasn't stopped me before. I can't imagine it would now. Victor Fang looked back out into the pouring rain. Uh, how long have you been in Howard's land? Nathan remembered the captain's warning, so he decided to play things safely. Long enough to know that this rainfall is something beyond natural. Duke Fang turned toward Nathan. His face was a map of scars. One of his eyes was pure white, gazing out sightlessly. The other seemed to see for both of them as it searchingly appraised Nathan. He gave a wry smile. My mother once told me that the rain was the gods' blessing on us, so Howard's land would never be without water. I wonder if she would say the same thing were she alive today. Nathan shrugged. Perhaps you are simply exceptionally blessed of late. Duke Fang shook his head. Before you came, my guards sent word. He gestured to a cage where ravens fluttered their wings. They say you were fighting. Broke curfew. Nathan bowed his head gently. I was unaware of the curfew until this last hour, my lord. He raised his eyebrows. You think me a fool? An old man out of touch with the world? Nathan narrowed his eyes. He was no politician, but he could tell when a head of state was aiming barbed words his way. I think nothing, Duke Fang. I know what man you are, Hayfield. Where you go... Violence follows. Death, despair, chaos. They follow you like plague flies follow infected corpses. And yet you persist. For two years, you have been gone. Then you show up on my doorstep. What brings you here? Once again, Nathan chose to play it safe. I have been searching for the ones who killed my mother. Duke Fang folded his arms. And that brought you to Howard's land? Nathan nodded. As strange as it may seem, the murders might be linked. I found three ne'er-do-wells harvesting corpses at Willow's Fall. They killed some guards of yours. Duke Fang scoffed. The more fool guards for being unprepared in the case of an ambush. Did you catch them? In a matter of speaking, their leader attempted to kill herself rather than divulge her employer. But she lives still, and... Nathan turned, just in time to see a ghostly woman walk in. She wore a long, flowing black dress. The bones of her body stuck out at odd angles, much like the city she resided in. She didn't appear starved, but her edges told a story all their own. Her black hair matched her dress, so in the dim light... Nathan had a hard time distinguishing where one ended and the other began. She regarded Nathan with no surprise, only curiosity. Duke Fang gestured to the new arrival. Ah, thank you for joining us, my lady. Nathan Hayfield, this is Duchess Lorelei Fang, my wife. Nathan bowed deeply. Duchess? She held out her hand and he dutifully kissed it. She spoke, 
Her voice was velvety and warm, like a fleece blanket in a winter storm. Her appealing exterior was in sharp contrast with that of her husband's. I apologize for interrupting, my dear. Do continue. Nathan turned back to the Duke. My lord, I hate to impose on you this late hour. If you like, I shall return to my rented room for the duration of the curfew, and we can speak on the morrow. Duke Fang nodded, then held up his finger. Just one thing. Do not interfere with the affairs of our people. Manage your own, and all will be well. Nathan nodded, and leaped off the balcony, flying into the darkness. As he sped back to the inn, one unsettling thought kept nagging his brain. The Duchess. I've seen her before somewhere.